It's a free meal. That's right. Something like that. That's right. <clears throat> Okay, let's get started. How many more degrees is it in here today than it is about five feet out there? I don't know how they managed to do it, right? Okay. A couple more classes, hopefully, and then we'll be complaining about the opposite problem. So, uh, I'm hot, you're hot. Bear, bear with us. Bear with us here. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Again, everything's uh, on Blackboard. Um, somebody mentioned that um, the tests are post when the tests are posted, it puts an announcement in Blackboard, um, but it doesn't send an email. I, from now on, when I post the test, when I get back to my office after class, I'll make sure that the Blackboard announcements also send you an email. So if you keep up to date through email, hopefully uh, that should that should work. Uh, any questions about Blackboards, the quizzes? So far, so good. OK, a uh, quick word about uh, Deliverable 1, just to jog your memory. Right, We're establishing this very, very simple feedback loop between you and the Leap Motion device, your Python code, which draws something to the screen, which is seen by your user, which causes them to move their hand. And around and around we go. Everyone managed to get Python installed? Matplotlib? So far, so good. Leap motion installed. It does if you install Canopy. So Canopy is the, the overarching system that includes all of the libraries you're going to need for this class. So if you successfully got Canopy installed, uh, you should be fine. Has anyone actually managed to finish this assignment? A couple people. OK, so you got a week left. That's fine. Again, I know some of you are rapidly catching up and brushing up on your Python skills. So keep on top of that. Just as a reminder, next Monday at 11.59 p.m., those three video deliverables will be uh, due in, in Blackboard. So you go to Blackboard, click on the assignment, and submit URLs that point to a YouTube playlist that contains your three video deliverables. Yep. OK. So let's have a quick look at the schedule, just to orient us to where we are and where we're going. Um, we're going to finish. We're going to finish lecture uh, two today. Move on to lecture three, which is packed analysis, which is people, activities, context, and technology. So this idea about how to think about uh, your users. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We'll probably finish lecture three today, and we'll probably start in on part of uh, lecture four. So again. The quizzes are going to cover whatever material we finish today. So if we just do lecture three, the questions tonight will be just on material from lecture three. If we get through the first few slides of lecture four, that might be a question in, in the quiz. OK, so as you can see, lectures four through eight, we're going to start to talk about uh, design. How do you actually go down, how do you actually sit down and start designing a piece of interactive technology or a piece of software for Leap Motion? that not only runs and doesn't crashes, 
but your user would prefer to use your ASL educational software over someone else's? What are the additional considerations we need to think about when we're designing, when we're thinking about creating a good uh, interface? We're going to spend a bit of time uh, talking about that. Um, there's some brackets in here about guest lecturers. I'm going to do, be doing a little bit of traveling uh, next month. We'll see where we, we get to, but you will have a guest lecturer at some point, uh, probably beginning of October. But we'll talk about that when we get there. Okay, then on to psychology and onward from there. So um, lecture two, we were talking about the basics of interaction, and I showed you this very simple cartoon of a human interacting with a piece of technology. The human does something, the piece of technology takes that output from the user as input, does something, and projects something back to the user, which the user sees or senses, right? The user acts, and there's a sensory repercussion of that action. When I act in the real world, there is also a sensory repercussion. When I act by asking a question, there's often a social repercussion, which is you answer my question, and around and around we go. We talked about John Dewey in the context of this feedback loop. Why the heck would we talk about a 19th century educational philosopher in an HCI class? What was the point that John Dewey made over 100 years ago that really matters for, for HCI? Uh, movement. How uh, that movement comes first and the sensory uh, comes second. Absolutely. According to Dewey, right? So think about the action first, which causes something to happen out in the world, and then we observe the repercussion of that action. Why would that matter? Well, if you show your leap motion device to some of your friends and not tell them what it is, just plug it in and say, this is a wireless mouse, watch what they do. Some people will sit back and passively wait for something to come up on the screen to tell them how to interact with this technology. Other users will immediately start to wave over the device or bang on it or grab it or, or move it around, right? Certain users will just instinctually start with action and see how the technology reacts. Others will sit and wait, right? This is part of another issue that we've, we've started to talk about in HCI that, pe that people are different, right? People are going to bring different assumptions to bear on your interface, and you're going to have to think about supporting that diverse group of people using your your interface. Okay. Okay, I think it's easier for the people in the back if I leave this in edit mode. Can you all see the bottom of the slide okay? All right. Okay, we got just about to the end of lecture two where we were talking about things that make HCI unique compared to other branches of computer science. HCI, we're going to draw on psychology for our theoretical base and some of the principles of software engineering for the design approach. Of course, we're talking about human-computer interaction. What do we mean by interaction? Well, there's lots of different kinds of ways that your user is going to be interacting with your system. Some of them are obvious, like physical interactions. Does your user wave their hand over the lead motion device, or do they grab it? But there's going to be increasingly less obvious kinds of interactions that are going on. And as a good HCI designer, you need to be aware of what those are or influence your user towards the kinds of perceptual and conceptual interactions that you want them to pay attention to. So I gave you this example of the Wii Remote last time, and we, right at the end we walked through the three different kinds of interaction that are possible with this device. So simple physical interaction is I move my uh, Wii Remote and I see something move on the screen, right? So I'm aiming uh, my arrow that I'm about to release from my bow. When I actually do release the arrow, I hear different sounds coming, one from the remote, one from the screen. They're separated or they're delayed in time, which was a clever hack put in by the creators of this video game to create the perceptual illusion or create this perceptual interaction that I released the arrow from my remote and it hit a target in the screen a short 
time later, right? Once I start to realize that's happening in the game, I'm building up a conceptual interaction. And conceptual interactions have to do with mental models and predictions, right? I push against the world and I have a prediction about how the world is going to push back. So once people play around with this a little bit and they move away from the screen, they're gonna have either consciously or unconsciously the prediction that now when they shoot the arrow, the time delay between the sound at the remote and the screen is going to be longer. Okay, if that expectation is not met, you're going to confuse the user, right? Okay, so we're thinking about these three different kinds of interaction as we, as we go. Okay, we're going to switch now as we move into lecture three about this idea about trying to think about our human users first and only then start to think about how to create our interactive system given those, those users. So putting people first it sounds pretty obvious and, and simple. As we go through this course, we're going to gradually keep unpacking this term and what do we mean, right? So what does it mean to put your users first as you're designing an interactive technology? Well, obviously, first you want to think about what does the user want to do? They want to learn ASL using your Leap Motion device. They might not actually be that interested in the Leap Motion device itself. How can I learn ASL as quickly and effortlessly as possible given your interface? and work backward from that user goal to what your interface should look like and what it should present to the user. Good examples of other interactive technologies out there is uh, designing new ways to connect people to people. So if you look at the history of computers, most of the killer apps have been ways that allow people to work well together better and not actually create new ways for people to collaborate that were difficult or impossible without computers or interactive technology. More specifically, again, this idea of creating synergies inherent in collaborative work, so making it easier for people to brainstorm or work together rather than to make it more difficult. Other ways you can put people first is involve them in the design process itself. So are there ways that the user can easily reach in and modify the interface so it's more appropriate for them, right? It's not a prepackaged piece of software, but something they can actually uh, modify and gradually get further further down into the guts of that interface if they want to. And again, designing for all of the different ways in which your, your users may differ. Okay, what are some examples of technology where these five things are done well? And what are some examples of technologies in which this is not done so well? Ideas. What are, some, what are some pieces of software out there that clearly by their design put the user first and what the user wants to do rather than what the technology can do? Are there examples of technology that advertise how great they are and all the bells and whistles that they have that completely overwhelm their users and confuse them rather than draw them in? All Adobe products. Okay, which side of the ledger is, are those going on? The latter, maybe. Yes, okay. Yeah, I mean, video editing, music production software, definitely on the side of the features. Okay, right. Here are all the amazing things you can do with your, your videos, right? Rather than starting simple, which is usually people want to cut and paste videos and publish it to YouTube, right? 90% of users, probably that's all they want to do. Those two features should probably be front and centered and everything else is hidden until the user advertises they want to do more. I was trying to buy a sandwich once. What's that? I was trying to buy a sandwich Okay. Once, and I went into this deli and the menu had so many items not anywhere on the wall. <laughs> it just got really overwhelmed. Absolutely. Sure, right? So there you go. There's a great interface, right? Signs or menus or options, right? Here are all of the possible things in a flat list that you can do. Go, right? Where do you, where do you start? Later on, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about navigation, right? Where am I? I'm trying to order a sandwich. What's, what am I supposed to do first? How do I, how do I know? Okay. Uh, Google, right, was brilliant, right? Put an empty bar, type in words, and click go. Right? I want to search for things that have to do with this, this keyword. Right? Start simple and all the machinery in the background is, is hidden. 
Designing new ways to connect people to people. What are ways in which people can interact now, given interactive technologies that were difficult or impossible before? Social networking, right? Who would ever want to write messages to each other in, what is it, 120 characters or less? Right? It's ridiculous. No one's ever going to want to use such, a, such an interface. Other examples of connecting people to people. First killer app was arguably a spreadsheet. doesn't really connect people to people. But the second killer app, email, right? People still use email, more or less. Maximizing synergies inherent in collaborative work. Have you worked with software that actually allows you to work better with members of a team? Or software that actually made it more difficult? See some nodding heads back here. Do you have an example? Uh, Sorry? Go to meeting. What's so great about GoToMeeting? Uh, or what's not so great about it? That you break up a lot. What's that? It's like breaking up a lot. It breaks up a lot? No, okay. But uh, it's all be the same place. Okay. Google Docs is awesome. Why? Um, because I, I was just using it today and I was um, editing something while someone else was editing something. And it was like we were sitting in the same room with the same piece of paper. Right, right. So that was a tricky thing to figure out for a long time, right? How do you allow two or more people to simultaneously edit a document, right? There are all these post-it notes and Adobe Reader and all that sort of thing, right? And Google figured out the, the cursors, right? You can see where, where each other, where the, where the authors are, right? Again, pretty simple, but once you figure it out, you can, two people in two different continents can work on the same document simultaneously. Good example. Involving people in the design process itself. You don't quite like the interface, you go in and, and change it or make it better. Yep, sure. IDEs, editing, editing software, documents, changing the, the interface itself. The wiki revolution, right? That web pages didn't have to be something that was fixed. You could actually go in and change the wiki page without having to know HTML. It made a relatively simple interface to go in and change and edit and add, which paved the way for Wikipedia uh, and so on. What are some simple things on your desktop or on your laptop that allow people uh, of diverse physical abilities to easily use uh, the software interface. Sorry? Voice to text, okay, yep, good example. Other examples? Some people pre pre uh, prefer to speak rather than type, or depending on your, your current situation, which of these two are you going to use? Text to speech, okay. What else? Some of you are wearing glasses, some of you aren't. Adjusting the size of the image. Exactly, right? Relatively easy on most platforms to very simply increase or decrease font size, right? You get on a new computer or you project it on the overhead here and you very rapidly change uh, font size. That'll be an obvious example. Okay, again, our red boxes, there's just a few examples that we touched on can write down some of your, your own, right? Okay. All right, so we're going to move on now to lecture three. Maybe. <clears throat> So we're going to talk now about packed analysis. So we're good HCI programmers. We know we have to think carefully about people, um, but how do we actually do this? Right? We can come up with examples where this is done well and answer ideas where this was done poorly. But what were the creators of Google Docs thinking about when they were trying to solve the problem about simultaneous authorship, allowing two or more people to write a document at the same time? 
What was the design process they went through to lead them to, to that idea? So we're going to start today with packed analysis, or analysis in general, and then in lecture four we're going to move on to this idea of design, actually sitting down and trying to create these kinds of interactive technologies that are easy uh, to use. Okay, so PACT, uh, an acronym just for people conducting activities in a context using technology. Um, and what I want you to take away from this acronym is then, again, it's not just about people, right? So what is it that the person is doing? What is the activity? And what is the context in which they're doing it? So as you're going about your day and you've got your smartphone, there are certain contexts that you're going to be in when you're going to prefer to type rather than dictate. And hopefully in this context right now, you're going to choose to type rather than speak, right? And at other times, it'll be the opposite. So it's not enough just to think about the person, but what is that person doing in their everyday lives? Where and when and how are they going to use the technology? So again, we're going to talk a little bit about design. How do we actually sit down and design software that supports all the people we want to support in all the activities they want to carry out in all the possible context or circumstances where they might do so. We're going to obviously talk a little bit about technologies, but we're going to do that last. We're going to think about P and C carefully first, and once we've done that, we should have some very specific ideas about T. Okay. So people, who exactly are we designing our software for? Who is going to be affected by it? So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about users and stakeholders. So a stakeholder might be someone who's affected by a piece of technology, but never actually uses it themselves. Can you think about a piece of technology and stakeholders? People that are affected by technology but aren't actually using it? Stakeholders. Sorry? Like people who have stock in a company. OK, right. So it's the company, but what is the technology? Maybe the company produces the technology. Yeah. Whether it's, right, they're going to either make money or they're not going to. So maybe you do decide to dictate into your smartphone in class, right? We're not using your smartphone, but you're definitely affecting all of us, right? Okay. Again, this is something that's often missed. You think very carefully about all your users, you support them perfectly, and then it turns out that there's a much larger group of stakeholders who are being affected by the technology, an important aspect of thinking about people when designing uh, technology. Okay. And again, uh, activities and context, this one can be a little bit more subtle and difficult to, to think about. It's not just the person, but where and when are they going to be using the technology. Okay. So let's try this. Here's uh, three groups of people and activities, uh, teenagers who are texting each other, people holding a video conference and someone who turns on their robot floor cleaner, which is the iRobot Roomba that you see there. Okay. So we want to create uh, technology to support these groups. And I'm going to now add context. So teenagers sending text messages to friends while driving. There's the context. People hold a video conference. Some are inside, some are outside. Again, this used to be a fictional scenario, but now if you've got Skype on your smartphones, you can hold a video conference inside or outside, maybe not so uh, fictional anymore. Someone turns on their robot fl floor cleaner, but they happen to have four cats uh, at home. Okay, let's focus on the first one. How does your thinking about the technology immediately change when I added the context of while driving? Imagine you're going to write some additional software for a smartphone to try and support the recent law against texting while driving. Right? It's being enforced, but is there a way we could help enforce this law through technology? Allow it to interpret voice. Allow it to interpret voice, OK. Okay, right, so my Bluetooth breaks and I say, okay, forget it, I'm not going to use the voice, I'm just, I really got to tell my friend about this, it's super important, so I'm going to text anyways. The phone might be able to like, shut off the texting feature if it's moving at a certain speed. Okay, so you have an accelerometer in your smartphone, if you, the acceleration is above some cer certain threshold, text is turned off. It's a, three lines of code, is this a good solution? Are on 
Could be. Yeah. Okay. That could be. Let's come back to the acceleration threshold, turning off texting. You're a passenger, right? You're a stakeholder. You're not actually driving the car. You just happen to be in the car, and you're affected by this, this software, right? It's a good first approximation, but now there are these, these ripple effects, right? So maybe that's not a good solution. Maybe we go with having to turn your car on with your cell phone, or there's some authentication uh, detail there, maybe. Is that a good solution? Big part of HCI is trying to poke holes in all of these solutions because there's some detail of the context that doesn't hold up. Let the cars drive themselves. What's that? Let the cars drive themselves, right? And then we can text uh, as we go. That may solve they, that may solve everything. A lot of like GPS apps will if you start to use it while you're moving, they'll say like please don't do this if you're driving. Okay. And you have to say like okay I'm not driving. Uh -huh. I'm not sure if that's actually a good solution because then I have to read that and like figure out what it wants to do. That's right, I'm trying to text and now a notification yeah. comes up which draws my attention to the phone, I think about what they say and have to press yes or no, right? Again, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about cognitive psychology and this perception action loop, right? Your screen flashes something because acceleration is detected above some threshold. If something is flashing or moving or making a sound, at least for the first tenth of a second, you can't help but turn and visually attend to that stimulus, right? You can try and ignore it as best you can, but you're attending to it, and it's drawing your attention away from something else. Okay. Yes, maybe driverless cars will make this all academic, but again, a good example of thinking about how thinking carefully about context or changing your thinking about context immediately changes your thoughts about what the technology should actually uh, be. Okay. I'll leave the other examples for you to fill in at your leisure. Okay, so we've already talked about one feedback loop uh, in this class, which is the user waves their hand over leap motion, and they see something on the screen, which causes them to change motion, and around and around you go, right? That perception and action feedback loop, the John Dewey <coughs> sensor motor coordination loop that we talked about last time, happens at a very fast time scale, right? Milliseconds or thousandths of a second. There is also a longer feedback loop that occurs with all technology, which is the moment you deploy a technology, you're going to change or increase the number of acti activities that people can carry out and maybe change their, uh, the context in which they do so. So the moment that texting, the, the first texting app was deployed for a smartphone that immediately created the novel activity and context of texting while driving which now might create a new opportunity for another piece of software that suppresses that, that activity. What are some other examples of technologies that once deployed created new opportunities that were capitalized on by new kinds of technology? Smartphones, smartphones themselves, right? The internet, the smartphone, right? They generated all kinds of new, new opportunities. You want to get ahead in computer science and HCI, be aware of this much longer, maybe not that much longer, feedback loop. So we're going to spend some time again when we're talking about design, is thinking very carefully about our people, activities, and context, PAC, and we're going to boil these down to requirements. They're going to let us think about the technology, what the technology should do and what it shouldn't do. Once we deploy the technology, that might create new opportunities that we want to uh, capitalize on. Okay, so very quickly, let's try and spit out some requirements for a video conferencing system that can be used both indoors and out of doors. What is one important thing that such a system must be able to do? For video and auto white balance, if I can put it Absolutely, auto white balance. Why auto white balance in this context? Or just exposure in general, it's going to be really difficult to see either angles or anything. Absolutely, right? So if you don't have experience with video, you might not, or sensing technology in general, you might not be aware of how extreme differences in light levels are inside and outdoors. If you're a photography expert, then, then you are. We're going to talk about 
the human visual system, which cancels out all of these differences, right? The light levels in here compared to light levels out there don't look that different to you because your brain is normalizing those, those differences and your software better do the same thing. Do you have an idea? Um, the fact that it's like inside or outside, you can yep. also have it uh, simulate a way to cancel out outside the noise and outside here. Absolutely, right? So you may be inside and there may be external noises, but for sure when you're outside, there's probably a lot more background noise than, than inside. Has anyone tried to Skype with someone who's outdoors? Skype does a pretty good job at canceling it out, but not, not perfect. It can be extremely disruptive. Okay, I'll leave the robot floor cleaner again as, a, as an example. Okay, let's assume that we create uh, this outdoor video conferencing uh, system. We deal with the light level issue, the background noise. What sorts of new activities are, uh, might this create? Besides holding a video conference with some people indoors or outdoors, how might this be useful? Uh, you could have like a field researcher actively kind of reporting on what they're doing instead of taking a video of it. Someone could ask a question and ask them to go investigate something. Uh, you could do it kind of in real time. Absolutely right. So rather than embedded uh, uh, media, you have embedded uh, professors or field researchers. Right, you're teaching from the field to students in in real time. Right, exceedingly. <coughs> You can almost do this now with Skype and smartphones, but not, not quite there yet. It's a good, good example. OK. So in the rest of lecture three here, we're going to march gradually through P and A and C, and then eventually to T. Let's start with people and forget about activities and context for the moment. We've already mentioned some of this. Obviously, people differ. And again, some of the ways in which people differ are more obvious than others. Right? So if you're dealing with leap motion, you'll very quickly realize that the size of your hand matters. And if you think about it a little bit more, it matters whether you're a lefty or a right-handed. People differ in all different kinds of ways uh, as well. Okay, um, Pattern recognition software is getting very mature now. You can usually find faces and people in a video stream automatically, but it's not perfect. Right? It obviously depends on uh, the person, whether they're recognizable or not. Uh, imagine that you have some uh, person recognition video surveillance software that you deploy. It's pretty good, but not perfect. Uh, it doesn't do so well with people that wear certain color clothing, but not other kinds of color clothing. Not such a big deal. Imagine that your software works better or, or worse for people with different colored skin. From the computer's point of view, it's algorithmically, it's almost the same problem. But culturally and politically, that's going to make a huge difference if you try and deploy that software. Right? So now we've just jumped from physical differences between people to cultural, psychological, political differences between groups. Right? Certain errors in your human recognition video software might be acceptable to the group as a whole, and some might be absolutely unacceptable. Right? OK. So again, obviously people differ psychologically, different cognitive biases. Some people look, like to look at pictures rather than listen to sounds if they're trying to work their way through understanding patterns uh, in a data set. So some people are better about thinking spatially. Some people tend to think better temporally over time. Let me hear that again, and I'll tell you if there's a difference in what I heard. Cultural differences, an obvious example of cultural differences is language differences. So if you look at the keys on the left there, right, we all recognize them as first or to the beginning, previous, next, and last, or to the end. Is that always true? If those labels weren't there, would everyone assume that the, left hand, the arrows that point to the left are first or previous? Are there groups of people that would assume otherwise? Okay, it looks like a play button in this part of the world. Why? Absolutely, right. It could be next chapter, but most right hand pointing arrows we assume means forward in time, right? It might, might be next chapter all the way to the end or forward by five seconds, but most of us will share that assumption. Uh, 
uh, subcultures read right to left, for example. Right? So we read left to right. So words that are to the right in our visual field are words that are coming up on, the, on a page of text, which led to this convention where rightward for facing arrows tend to mean ahead in time and leftward back in time. If you're uh, a young person growing up uh, in Japan or Israel, you don't have those assumptions. right? So you might guess and figure it out by, again, playing with the interface. But if you want to skip to the next chapter, if you grow up in Israel, you might click on the left facing arrow, right? And suddenly you jump backward a chapter. If you're a very young person, that could be extremely confusing. Depends on who you're developing your software for. Okay. Uh, usage differences. Again, you might have the same people in the same culture, um, but they have very different experience levels, right? Most novices tend to work with uh, the mouse, most people, if they're using the same software over and over again, will learn keyboard short, shortcuts and work with it uh, very differently. Discretionary users, uh, these are users who are being forced to use the technology against their will. I hope no one in this room has ever used PeopleSoft. Oh, some people have, I can tell, right? Okay, let's say as little about PeopleSoft as possible. For those who don't know, it's used for most human resources and admin features. Uh, at UVM, uh, faculty, faculty didn't have a say in it. I'm pretty sure you guys didn't have a, a say in it, right? A decision was made, and PeopleSoft it is. It's hard to use already, but now on top of being forced to use it, changes the way that people tend to use it. Okay. Okay, so again, we want to think about all the different ways that people uh, differ. Now we're going to think about the activities themselves. What is the person trying to do? What is the activity? Might the way in which two different people carry out this activity be very different? So in the way that we just tried to think about all the different ways that people may differ, let's think about all the different ways that a particular activity that someone's trying to carry out with your technology differs. Okay. Broke this into a list of 10. You could probably break this into lists of more or less. But the first four are going to have to do with temporal aspects or time-related aspects. How the activity uh, unfolds in time. Is this an activity carried out by a single person uh, or more than one person? How well-defined is this activity? Does the person actually know exactly what they want to do from one step to the next? How safety-critical is the activity? How are you going to deal with mistakes on the, point, on the part of the user or mistakes on uh, the part of the technology? And then, only then, in 9 and 10, do we get into what's the nature of the content or what are the building blocks that are needed for a person to carry out this, this activity? Okay, so I'll jump backward, uh, forward and backward to this slide a couple times. Let's start with the temporal aspects. Uh, how regular or infrequently is the activity uh, taken take place? Is it something they're going to sit down and do it all in one go? Is someone going to use your Leap Motion software and try and learn all of the letters in the ASL alphabet in one go? Or are they going to come back to your software from time to time? Are they going to come back once a day? Maybe they'll use it every day for a month and then not use it for six months and then come back. Again, cognitive psychology, people forget. So what happens? What should you show the user if they come back to the system an hour later, a day later, or a month later? Right? Depends on the person. Uh, usage history again. Smooth, is it going to be something they use continuously over time? Is your phone always on and vibrating and telling you whether you're getting text messages? Or is it something that you're doing at particular points in time? If it's something, if it's a task or activity that's interrupted, how does somebody find their place again? So what's an obvious a a widget in interactive systems that lets you find your place again if you come back to an activity after some time has elapsed? Just yes. Okay. Code Academy. Code Academy. How does Code Academy help you find your place? It your progress, and then if you leave it, it will just, it will just come back to the place that you left off. Absolutely right. The save function. I got this far. Save whatever that means, and when I come back. Don't take me to the first page, take me to my saved place, right? Pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay, that's pretty straightforward, but let's think a little bit more deeply about what the activity is. Is it linear progress? Can I start here and just go forward in time, or is there more internal 
structure. And to set up this uh, discussion, I'm going to walk you through it, uh, the parable of Tempus and Hora. This comes from Herbert Simon, a Nobel Prize winner back in the 60s, uh, who thought very uh, deeply about human behavior and economics. Okay. Uh, in the parable of Tempest and Horror, both of them are watchmakers who made very fine watches. However, as they were making their watches, uh, the phones in their workshop rang frequently. New customers were always calling them. Um, Hora prospered while Tempest became poorer and poorer. In the end, Tempest lost his shop. What was the reason behind this? Well, the reason behind it was because they made watches in different ways. The watches consisted of about a thousand parts each. Uh, the watches that Tempest made were designed such that when he had put down a partly assembled watch to answer the phone, it immediately fell into pieces and had to be reassembled from the basic elements. Right? Not a good way to do things if you have to get through all a thousand pieces before you're interrupted. Hora, on the other hand, designed his watches, or he designed his activity, which was building watches, in a different way. So Hora designed his watches so that he can put together sub-assemblies of about 10 components each. So he built these sub-assemblies of 10 pieces, then took these 10 sub-assemblies, put them together into a larger sub-assembly, and so on and so forth, so that finally 10 of the larger sub-assemblies constituted the whole watch. Each sub-assembly, once done, and it was only made up of 10 actions, would, uh, uh, would not fall apart when, when put down. So here's my little cartoon to try and show how this works. So here's uh, poor Tempest here, who uh, adds a piece and is interrupted and breaks, adds another piece and is interrupted and breaks. Hora, on the other hand, makes sure that he has a stable sub-assembly, builds these sub-assemblies and only then puts them together. So at any point in time when there's an interruption, he still has the component pieces. What is the abstract principle that Herb Simon was trying to get at here? It's not about watches, it's about the design process itself. Modularity. Modularity, right? So when you save and come back to something, it might not necessarily show you in a linear sequence where you are, but if it's a learning piece of software, you've gone through these three modules and you're 10% of the way through module four, right? I've designed this course to be hierarchical, right? The course is about HCI. There are six themes. Within each theme, there's a couple of lectures. Each lecture is made up of a bunch of slides. Each slide is made up of a bunch of bullet points, uh, and so on, right? Although this is a lot of PowerPoint, I've tried to organize things hierarchically so it's easier for you to chunk together the major issues we talk about and remember things better, right? If you're studying and you forget where you are, at least you remember you were in Lecture 7, and Lecture 7 was about design in general, right? You can more easily find your place when you stop studying HCI and you come back to it uh, a few days later. Okay. Response time. This is going to be something we talk about uh, quite a bit. So again, back to the loop of sensor motor coordination that Dewey mentioned. The moment I send commands to the muscles in my arm, I see my arm enter my visual field almost immediately, right? Throughout my life, that expectation has never been broken, right? If I move my mouse and I see the cursor move a tenth of a second later, I'm going to be extremely frustrated, right? We have an expectation that when you move the mouse and something moves on the screen, it should at least, from our point of view, be simultaneously. Can you think of examples where your expectations about these kinds of timing events were broken? So we talked about the spiral of death, right? That means put all your expectations on hold. I might get back to you in the next second. I might never get back to you. When your uh, arm falls asleep. When your arm falls asleep? OK, how's that an example? Uh, it's you, you like try to send a signal to a okay. win. Okay, that's true, right? It's very, it's very jarring, right? If you ever had that, that happen. What about with software or technology? You expected a particular rate of response, but it wasn't met. It's like on a link, it takes more than four or five seconds to load. Okay, right. And again, our expectation about that is coming down every every year. Have you ever used a friend's laptop and the sensitivity of the mouse 
was much more or much less on your system, right? It's you kind of pull back for a minute, you're a little bit surprised, and then you gradually get used to it, or you slow down or speed up the, the mouse response rate. Right? You have an expectation from your own system that doesn't hold up on, on another system. Okay. Again, we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about that. Cooperation, again, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about groupware or software that allows people to work well uh, together. Complexity, what is the person going to do? Is there a very clear set of steps that they're going to carry out? Or is the activity kind of vague, right? Are they going to surf the net? Or are they going to do some very specific research in Wikipedia, right? How vague or how well defined uh, is the task? Then we get into safety, right? Um, are we going to catch mistakes before they happen or catch mistakes after they happen? Are we going to do proactive error handling? We're going to make sure that no one makes a mistake in the first place, or do retroactive error, ha error handling will deal with the mistake after it, it happens. How do we decide which of these two uh, to use? Here's an example where this went catastrophically wrong. This is the case study of the Therac 25. Uh, it was a piece of medical therapy uh, technology from the 1980s. This is arguably the worst software bug uh, in history, killed five people, injured many, many more. I'm just going to give you the summary of Therac 25, uh, and you can go read about this at your, your leisure. Okay. There was an earlier device called the Therac 20, and in the Therac 20 and the Therac 25, it was used for uh, providing uh, x ray irradiation to someone who's already suffering from a cancerous tumor somewhere just under the surface of their, their skin. Uh, there's an electron gun, electrons in red, I apologize, there's a typo in your slides, it says x-ray gun, should say electron gun. Electron gun emits a beam of electrons, these beams hit an x-ray shield, which was basically a lead block, and this very thin focused beam passes partly through the lead and creates on the other side a cloud with a very specific geometry that provides when it's working, just the right amount of radiation to just the tumor and nothing else. Pretty simple machine, and again, it was designed to be very simple because, again, as things get more complicated, there's many more things that can go, go wrong. All right. Specification of the requirements for, for the Therac series is a command is sent to move the shields into position, and their position is slightly different for different patients given uh, where the tumor is. The shields then move in response to that command. Uh, the command is sent to the electron gun to fire the beam, and the gun fires. Okay, Worked perfectly for the Therac 20. Under these specifications, it failed catastrophically in the Therac 25 using the same four specifications. So without flipping to the next slide, anybody want to hazard a guess as to why? What, could, what would go wrong here? Absolutely, right? There's no explicit specification here that says fire the gun only when the blocks have moved into position, right? It seems like an obvious thing to put into the specifications, easy for us to say after the fact. Okay, so the actual events uh, that occurred in the Therac 25, the command was sent to move the shields. The shields started moving but hadn't uh, reached their target position before the command was sent, the gun actually fired, and in many cases, patients were directly radiated by an electron beam uh, that hit the surface of the skin, and they received orders of magnitude more radiation than they were supposed to. Even a very, very simple machine like this, if you don't get your specifications right, you don't think carefully about the hardware side of things. In this case, this wasn't really uh, anything to do with the person or the activity, but the context. These these shields themselves. Okay. Clearly, in medical technology, we usually want to be proactive about safety, right? Much harder to fix things after the, the fact. Okay. So how would we know whether to use a proactive or retroactive security uh, system? Okay. What is it that we're going to present to the user? Now we get into uh, the nature of the content itself. Again, when we start to talk about psychology, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about visual perception and auditory perception, 
how should you communicate information to the user? When the user does something with your Leap Motion device, what are you going to show them on the screen? Uh, do you have large or small data requirements? Uh, is your data streamy or chunky? It's a terrible way of talking about data, but captures the idea. Streamy, you have a real-time video or speech stream. Chunky, you have icons or text or images. Uh, streamy has the, adv uh, the advantage in that you're able to communicate a lot of information pretty quickly. Right? An image is worth a thousand words and a video is literally a thousand images, right? You can actually present your user with a lot of information. If you have a video stream or you have an animation, it might be too much, right? You can also, in a real-time auditory track, often detect changes or rhythms or regularities much easier than if you're looking at the same data presented visually. So we'll come back to that again. So how you choose to present your data or establish this sensor motor link depends on thinking carefully about how the visual system, or human visual system works and how the human auditory system works. Okay, then we can make decisions about 2D or 3D. Are we gonna use text or motion or sound or combine them and go from there? Okay. Let's move on to context now. So again, let's start with the most obvious things and move on to the less and less obvious kinds of contexts that are going to matter. Physical context, pretty obvious. Um, is this something that's gonna be used indoors or outside? Is it gonna be used on a smartphone with a whole bunch of people around? Is it gonna be used in private? Um, does internet matter? Is this something that's gonna be used uh, where there's lots of Wi-Fi hotspots? Is it gonna be somewhere that's remote? These are things you can probably answer pretty quickly once you start to think about your technology. Um, social context gets a little bit trickier. How supportive is the environment? Um, are there a lot of manuals? This shows how dated this particular slide is, right? When was the last time somebody read a manual for their new smartphone or their new app that they downloaded on their phone? Not too much, right? That's evidence that people are getting better at HCI. If you design your interface well, you shouldn't need a manual, or you should definitely need a minimum of text. Okay, assuming you do get confused, how can you get support, right? On most web pages, there's a question mark somewhere, and it's usually in the upper right of the page, right? It's relatively easy to go find support or get help. If somebody plugs in your Leap Motion device and you tell them to use it to learn ASL, and they say, I don't know where to get started, there's something wrong, right? How do we know to show people where, where to go? Okay, social context, again, this is kind of overlaps with physical environment. Uh, where are they using it? Organizational context, right? What's the bigger picture here? Again, thinking about stakeholders. What's the impact on not just the person who's gonna use this technology, but all of their friends on social media or stakeholders that are never gonna be, who are never going to see the technology uh, directly? If we deploy a technology that's useful, um, you can be sure it's going to be disruptive and it's going to change the way people do things. And it's going to create jobs, destroy jobs, and change jobs. Okay, so only after we've thought carefully about P and A and C, now we can sit down and start thinking about technology. We don't want to start with T, we want to start with the other three. These are a little bit more obvious. What is the input to your Leap Motion ASL software? What is its output and why? What else is your software going to be communicating with? And then finally, the internals. Now you're finally ready to sit down and actually write the code itself. We're not gonna talk about that part in this course. There's a sister course to HCI, which is software engineering, which is all about <laughs> creating the guts of your software that the user probably will never, never see. Right? We're gonna focus on the interface in this course, which is really about input and output and who else or what else does your software talk to? Okay. So let's have a look at a few examples now. Okay, the infamous BitTorrent. Who are the people? Who are the activities? What's the context? And what was the technological solution? Uh, well, in the 90s, there was an observation that someone would suddenly have a very, very large file at a certain time and that a whole bunch of other people wanted exactly that file that only one person 
add all the pieces up. So here's a very large file that's broken up into a bunch of pieces. So the moment that you have one person that has a very, very large piece of data, which is suddenly very, very popular to a large group of people, you have a bottleneck problem, right? Everybody's going to start to draw down that large piece of data from, from that person. BitTorrent turned things around and said, how do we get past that bottleneck? Well, the easy way to get past that bottleneck is to take that huge piece of data, chop it up into small pieces, represented by the colored dots here, and give different people different pieces of the data. Don't give everyone the red dot, then everyone the orange dot, and so on, right? Because everybody is then missing the other piece. So once you give the red dot to somebody else, that reduces the demand on you for the red dot, right? So BitTorrent basically blurred the distinction between servers and clients. This technology was a, a response, obviously, to the beginning of sharing of illegal content. Okay. okay, so let's shift gears for a moment now. Here's, again, four more examples, each one of these uh, describes particular people and activities and contexts. I want you to turn to your neighbor and just spend about uh, 30 seconds or a minute on each of these four sketching out the ideas of technology that addresses the particular kinds of people and activities and contexts that are mentioned here. You don't have to get into the details, but just an initial sketch of technology to support uh, Stores in a mall that want to scan shopping bags of people walking by and show in the storefront ads tailored to whatever is associated with that particular kind of shopping bag. Uh, people want to visualize BitTorrent across the internet. We talked about visual design. How would you visualize who has what? And could you guess from that, that visualization what kind of data it is? Homeowners who want not the Roomba that cleans your floor, but another indoor robot that paints the walls. A set of wireless sensors deployed in a rainforest to collect environmental data. So wireless sensors, as the name implies, very cheap sensors that have a local battery source and they collect sensor data where they're placed and broadcast it intermittently back to uh, a piece of software that collects that data. Okay, turn to your neighbor Think a little bit about the kinds of technologies that would support these people, activities, and contexts, and we'll see what you came up with. Yeah. 
quick brainstorming here. Let's start with number one. Who has an idea of a technology sketch that takes into account this particular kind of context? Could visualize any kind of data that anyone has on their machines with specific to bit to write. Why would you want to visualize who has what? Map of active file transfers, that's a good idea, right? Who traded what with whom, yeah. right? Which would be probably important for people that are trying to figure out where and with whom a particular file originated. Right? Again, it depends on the context, some of which is explicit, some of which is implicit. How about number two here? Anybody remember from Minority Report a few years ago? Tom Cruise is walking through the mall and it starts to advertise things specifically for him, which was a problem because he was trying to stay undercover. We're pretty close to that, not quite there yet. Makes sense. So let's make a smart shopping bag, which makes the job easier, right? It's happened on the internet because it's it's easy to know who bought what at what at what point and target ads towards them, right? The minute we change the context, now we're talking about shoppers not online, but in a mall, changes the changes the kind of technology. How would we go about making a smart bag? Let's pursue this idea for a minute. Any uh, engineers here? Thank you. Okay, so RFID chips are going to come up quite a few times in this course. 
Uh, do you want to hazard a summary of what an RFID chip is? Um, I don't know the specifics, but okay. it's, I know that it broadcasts just like a uniquely identifiable signal on a radio frequency. That's it. So RFID tag collects uh, radio waves and, and extracts just enough energy from them to broadcast something back, right? If we're going to attach hardware to bags, they should be cheap and probably not have a massive battery and where you go. You could, like, along with printing the receipt, print a QR code or something on the side of the bag. Okay. And that would be really easy to pick up on the camera. Okay, right. So we put QR codes on the receipt and stick it on the side of the, the bag, right? There's a cheaper option than RFID tags, right? Okay. All right, we'll leave that one for a moment. Um, let's do robots painting indoor walls. Absolutely, right? So all you got to do is look around this room and you'll start to realize there's a whole bunch of exceptions to just blindly painting the walls, right? Walls aren't flat. Some parts of this room we may want painted, some we might not. We don't want to have to write some complicated software to let the robot recognize blackboards and moldings and so on. Again, like the example with the QR code, let's just put up some magnetic tape that says don't paint any further than, than this point. Okay. Wireless sensors deployed in a rainforest for environmental modeling. What are some specific aspects of this technology we have to think about given this specific context? It has to be very energy efficient. It has to be very energy efficient, right? So they're going to probably be somewhere that's quite remote from a Wi-Fi hotspot or a source of power. Okay, let's play a similar game, which is I'm going to take the same four examples and now again change the context. So in number one, now we know a little bit more about the user group we're trying to support, um, and they would like to be able to distinguish legal from illegal content. And this is always a cat and mouse game, because the moment they figure this out, the torrenters will figure out some other way to disguise illegal content as legal content. Do you have a question? Okay, we want to deploy our system in the mall, but maybe we don't want to be, or maybe for legal reasons, we're not allowed to target ads to shoppers that are under the age of 18. How do we deal with that change? And in this case, people. Uh, we don't want robots that paint over posters. Maybe our magnetic tape idea already deals with this situation. How does your thinking about wireless sensors change when we're a little bit more specific? We want the spence, the sensors to be deployed in the canopy uh, in the rainforest. All right, let's just do this in an interactive manner. Pick any one of these four. How did your thinking about the technology changed, change the moment you saw the change in context for our target users? How could you tell by looking at the dynamics of file sharing on BitTorrent whether someone had just shot a home movie that was large and was sharing that on the internet compared to the latest Hollywood movie? Legacy versus important ad. Actual access to it. How frequently downloaded it is, and then like in particular, I know movies are going to a lot, so right. probably work in some sort of software like what YouTube and other video sharing services have done to just examine certain. Yes, we could dive into the internals of the data itself and look for certain signatures of illegal content. But we could try and do it without having to do that, maybe for privacy reasons. Right? So popularity is one of them. That would be one thing. But cute kitten videos are also very popular on, on the internet. You could look at what torrent trackers the torrent's connected to. What, I don't know what a torrent tracker is. It's a server that Okay. So most, mostly you'll find all the legal files on one tracker, and then you can tell if they could torrent has a Linux tracker that works. Okay. It's probably legal. Okay. So. Yes, there's specific content again we could, we could look at. Think about the context here. A new Hollywood movie is released, someone pirates it and shares it on BitTorrent. Maybe length. Length? Because a cat video can be, I don't know, two minutes, and 
that You'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe, maybe length. Right? There might be a whole bunch of these lines of evidence that we bring together. Right? Maybe you keep track of when something is deployed based on release dates of movies that are likely to be very popular on BitTorrent. Sure, right, again, we can get right into the content. Are there indirect cues that we could use uh, if that's not available? Okay, we don't want to personalize ads to shoppers under 18. There could be a, a camera that observes faces and there's some kind of face recognition software that then uh, goes through a database of like the driver's license photo Okay, so we could deploy some face recognition software. Microsoft has this product now that tries to estimate your age directly from facial features. Could go that route. What's the disadvantage of that approach? Absolutely, right? So back to safety. What happens if it makes a mistake? Face recognition software is getting better, but it's certainly far from, from perfect. Is there a simpler solution than deploying face recognition software? So again, think about our initial sketch of this technology. Um, I don't know, this, like the people who go in stores and get out the receipts or the bags or whatever, you know, they ask the customer if they're over 18 or not. Simple, right? So again, it doesn't have to be a technological solution. Just not everyone is going to get a smart bag or a QR code, right? You show your ID, and if you don't agree, it's assumed you're under 18 and you're given a non-smart bag. Right? Could be could be something very simple. Just takes thinking about the the technology. Okay, um, I think we solved number three here already. What about number four? How does your changing? How does your thinking about the technology change? Do you want to specifically deploy to a rainforest canopy? Okay, right, so it either has to latch on to something. We're we gonna have people climb up and, and deploy them. How are these actually gonna be deployed? What else changes? If it's in the canopy and you maybe want to use solar to actually power it, you'd have to extend something or you have to extend it. Absolutely, yeah. right? So physical context is important here. We can't assume massive batteries. Somebody mentioned power already probably want to go with solar. If it's a rainforest, there's probably plenty of sunlight around. It's not the rainy season. But if you specifically want to be in the canopy, solar is out again, right? This one has a lot to do with the subtleties of the physical context in which you're going to deploy the technology. Number two has a lot to do with political and legal aspects of context. Okay. That's the end of lecture three, so this is probably a good place to stop for today. Thanks for bearing with us in this particular physical context of massive heat. We'll see you on uh, Thursday. Quiz number three, we'll be due at 11.59 tonight. I'll go back and put it on Blackboard. Thank you.